excited for the conversation today. Uh, today's guest is someone who knows a lot about where the future of content and other, we'll call it like marketing, other like technology related topics is headed. If you've been listening to the show for the last, I mean, I feel like most people are probably like, Jay, can you please talk about something else? But um, I really can't because it's that important. And so today we're going to talk about, um, you know, content, AI, how to think about this for your own organization, how other organizations are thinking about, you know, implementing uh, generative AI and other tools. And so really excited to have Keegan Caldwell on the show and give his perspective. Keegan, welcome. Yeah, it's really great to be here. I'm excited about it. Uh, and I empathize with the listeners as well. There's certainly a lot of content out there related to AI and ML. Um, but this, uh, I, I think some of the issues that we talk, talk about today are unique and they're things that are going to shape how we deal with all this as a society uh, moving forward. Yeah, I, exactly. And that's what I'm, I think I'm excited for is for a lot of folks. I think it's, um, I don't know enough about it or... I've dabbled with it and I've moved on and, and I just feel like, you know, for a lot of people, this is not one of those technologies that you can afford to not continue to educate yourself on or learn how to use because it is going to be so ingrained into so many different things, whatever the final version or the ever evolving version ends up being. And so that's why we keep talking about it. So yeah, Keegan, why don't you tell everyone just maybe a little bit about your background, man? You know, you've got a pretty... Uh, interesting sure. background in terms of how you've landed where you're at and a little bit about, you know, your company as well. Yeah, sure. I'll try not to filibuster the whole podcast with my own <laughs> personal details, but I'll give I'll give the big ticket items. Um, so uh, I founded this firm uh, set like seven years ago. Uh, it was just me, like many founders in like a, a one person co-working space office, a windowless office across from a bathroom. Uh, and uh, we, put, we ended up putting two people in. One guy had to get up so the other guy could get out because it was so, so they're like, <laughs> and uh, I remember yeah. those days, man. Yeah, exactly. I look really fondly upon those days uh, myself. But uh, before that, um, just a couple, you know, things about my personal history is, uh, you know, when I got out of, uh, I, when I finished high school, I, I joined the Marine Corps. You know, I served for you know, several years in the Marine Corps. And then um, when I got out, had some issues adapting back to civilian life, um, fell into some substance abuse uh, issues, um, which resulted in several different arrests and uh, uh, felony convictions ultimately. Um, at some point uh, in 2006, I decided to get my act together and was like, I don't want to live this way anymore. It was clear that uh, while some people are able to you know, drink and have a good time doing those things. I was just not one of those people <laughs> and, uh, uh, that became very evident. And um, yeah. so I needed to make some changes and I made those changes and uh, man, oh, it was like totally has changed the direction of my life. And awesome, uh, man. So, yeah, I'm like super grateful to have made that kind of shift at that point in my life and um, uh, got sober, uh, started school use my GI bill to go to college. Uh, I thought I'd be a dentist. Um, and <laughs> interesting. All right. Yeah, well, the most successful guy, you know, the most successful guy I knew was my grandfather who was a dentist. And so I was yeah. like, well, he had like nine kids and, you know, seemed like he, he was reasonably happy and it was a good path, you know? And so I was like, well, that's what I'll do. And then, uh, somewhere along the way I got, um, I decided to get a, a PhD instead of going to dental school. Um, and so I went and got a PhD in physical chemistry. It's basically like physics. And, um, and a, a, a lot of the reason for that was to put some more time in between myself and all those uh, criminal charges. Cause I knew that just putting a couple years in between with my undergraduate, wasn't like someone was going to yeah. scoop me up. IBM was going to scoop me up and be like, this is a great guy. Let's hire this guy. Right. Um, that, uh, I knew that there were some hurdles that I was going to have to face and that a, a little bit more time in between me and that stuff and a better story arc and throwing some more letters after my name would benefit uh, myself go. and probably the community as a whole. So that was what I did. Did an internship at the patent office during that time, became interested in patent law, um, took the patent bar, uh, which you can take without going to law school. Interesting. Yeah. And then I took a job at a law firm um, and uh, 
you know, started working at this law firm. It turns out that in California and in Vermont, you can take the state bar also without going to law school. And, uh, and you can kind of like study for like Kim Kardashian does this famously. And uh, right, 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 right. She actually has not passed the bar, but I have, uh, and, uh, just throwing that out there, Kim. Uh, and, (laughs) and then, uh, I don't know. The only other person that I know that's done this is Abraham Lincoln. So I don't there you know. go. All right. I'm not, I'm not, it's not exclusive company. That comparison exclusive at all. Exclusive company. Yeah, no, it, it is good company for sure. Um, and you'd think that I would know someone else that did this kind of apprenticeship sort of law yeah. study thing, but I, I genuinely have never met anyone else that's done it. So yeah, so everyone else just is, takes the traditional, the, so the traditional super route. non-traditional path for me to get where I am and. I left the firm where I was working to start this. I wanted something more entrepreneurial um, where I'm a patent attorney. So was naturally focused on technology. That one person office that I talked about in the beginning um, was on MIT's campus. I figured that if I was on, you know, like the campus, that's like generating all this technology. Even if I got the scraps, yeah, well, I might be able to the survive. Scra- right? <laughs> the scraps. Yeah, I love it. I mean, on my floor in that, co- you know, understand on my floor in that co-working space, there was uh, seven other law firms. So it was like everyone had the same idea, the right? Same and concept. Yeah. A lot of them were like law- large law firms that this was just like an expensive business card for them to have an office there. So um, yeah, exactly. we started there. It was just, just me when we got started. Since then, we've, you know, grown to over 50 of us. We have offices in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm currently sitting in my office in Los Angeles, uh, looking out at Santa Monica Pier and Santa Monica Beach right out the window here. You can't beat it. Um, there's windows in this office, so that, that's been an upgrade. Uh, <laughs> no and then, uh, we have uh, a brand new office in London, in Mayfair in London, um, which is a very exciting expansion. And all, all these things have kind of happened because we've, we're, we've been focused on technology companies, high growth technology companies, which inevitably includes a lot of AI ML companies the last five years. Uh, I can imagine, well, especially now, I mean, I'm a, a part of an investment fund and uh, part of what they've been doing, you know, in the last like five, five probably like three months is every, every week they send out four new sales AI technology tools, four per week. Yeah. And the list and the list is not, like, I, don't, I don't think they're running out, um, you know, anytime soon. So so let's let's jump in, man. I mean, you've seen this again from like the other, you know, the legal side too. that there's a business application, the implications of this. Like what are you know, let's talk maybe first about AI generated content. Sure. And, you know, so many companies now are using it to generate content. Um, how, and again, your background, think patent, think, you know, that's like how does ownership of AI content work. So if I'm out there and I'm doing this, I've got all these tools and I'm using chat GPT on the back end for my LL, you know, my LLM, but I've got yeah. a proprietary, whatever, like for those who aren't aware. And I think my own knowledge, like how does ownership work in this type of world, this new world? So this is the million dollar question. And there's, there's some murky answers legally. And then there's some uh answers that seem to be more sound with the courts and i'll just i'm gonna actually i'll just give a quick lawyerly disclaimer that uh none of this is legal advice but none uh, of this that's, is that's, meant that's to be legal about that. that's the most boring thing i'll say hopefully yeah that's good. Uh, so uh really got to kind of divide i'm going to divide this up into a couple different categories to talk about it um one of those is patents which i'll talk about in a minute and then the other one is copyrights right so copyrights protect written works like the piece of art behind me or you know uh a Bob Dylan song lyrics or something like that, or the, the sonnets that used to write an old girlfriend or whatever. Uh, and so, um, you know, copyrights first, digging into that first, does anybody own a copyright um, that uh, own a copyright in a work produced using AI, right? So you plug something into chat, chat GPT or something like that, do it or, or any AI, let's just, we'll talk yeah, about sure. Bang, doesn't matter, yeah. any sort of AI. Um, is that something that's protectable? Well, like the way that the statute reads is that copyright protection um, is in original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression, right? So, it, but then what does that mean, right? Like, does this rec- does that mean that an AI can do it or a human can do it? So like, can a non-human author be an author for the purposes of copyright protection? And there is a little bit of guidance on this from 
like a congressional research service report on generative AI and copyright law. And the answer, I mean, it's like a really long paper, but you know, the short answer is probably no, right? Probably the AI for the AI, no. Uh, past cases like involving, like there's this kind of famous case about these monkeys creating um, art, <laughs> or right? Original works of art. And can, can the monkeys get a copyright on these, right? Interesting. And, uh, yeah, the court said no, you, monkeys, you cannot do that. And uh, and then the, another fun one is there's this other case about divinely inspired works. So, like here, uh, there's like people representing this like religious foundation, and they are like picking and formulating specific questions that they're asking their celestial being, right? And uh, and so they're they're the ones dictating what's going to come back, right? The structure and the order, right, the right, right, right. And so there's like this really extremely low threshold for creativity that was met here. And, and the court notes that, you know, intriguingly that the Copyright Act does not explicitly require a human author, right? So that's that's interesting in this particular case. And while, but they still conclude that, you know, works directly of divine beings are not what the act was intended to protect. And so the particular and the order and arrangement in which right um, exactly so the book was presented in this case like it would be uh it would infringe a copyright owned by uh, a plaintiff so and then just like one other thing real quick on copyrights is it because this is going to pop up a couple other times there's this guy stephen thaler and this is like a recent case that uh, the patent office has taken on because he's tried to um he's like a, a, a creator of artificial intelligence products and he's yep. sued for both copyright and patent protection um, with AI as the author and inventor and, uh, and the patent case was rejected. So that's, and that's one that'll pop up a couple of times here. So that's, that's a good yep. segue to patents, right? So yep. for patents, you know, patents, um, protect innovations, right? And you get a 20 year monopoly at used in, at least in the United States on those innovations that uh, you're granted a patent on and people almost certainly get patents on products that are produced using AI all the time. Of course. Yeah. Well, like an example, like a great example of this that we that we're using right now to just have this conversation is like any hardware circuit, um, like a microprocessor chip, it'll be designed by human engineers, but it's optimized using artificial intelligence. Right. And in a case like this, the design per parameters are conceived by human, right? And then it's just uh, implemented by the AI rather. And so there's pro there's really nothing to really prevent something like that from being patented. Um, but then like, what if a generative AI program <laughs> is given only a problem to solve and no human being provides a solution? And this goes back to the case. Yeah. The, the one that I was just talking about, this Thaler guy. Um, and like so far, the courts don't allow an AI program to be credited as an inventor. Right. You, know, and, you know, this could change over time, but uh, m my guess is that while it kind of creates some exciting discussion that it's going right. to remain, there's got to be a human sort of, there's got to be case. some, yeah, in the loop on, on the output or, or I guess like hypothetically, Keegan couldn't like open AI say, well, we created this content. So it's actually, it's, it's our content. Like, yeah. We well, they could. I'm going to get to that actually. Yeah. yeah. So okay. All right. All right. All right. They're, they're pretty liberal with their stuff. So that's, what's, that's, what's great. And I think that that is what's going to be a big part of their success story with open AI. Is to not do that. But yeah, but like yeah. my, I guess my, you know, just personal reasoning, like based on my own experience with governments and, you know, the governments are set up to the, to protect the citizens. They're not set up to protect machines. And so right. my guess is that, you know, that's the order that it'll follow here, right? Like there's no rights or protection given to particular machines. So I can't imagine that that's going to happen in the future. We'll be granting patent rights to AI generated content. That would be right. um, hard for A me. A slippery to slope. Yeah. That yeah. Would yeah, be pro exactly. yeah. Um, and then, so who owns, now this gets to the million dollar question, who owns the content generated by chat GPT, right? So OpenAI has a policy page and they get right into it, like on their policy page, they don't, they do not own the output of the program, right? So your, your content, you provide the input and receive an output. 
And yeah. that's like collectively what they're going to call content. And they're saying that, you know, as long as you're going to comply with the terms that they have within their right. policy page, that uh, um, the content the, that uh, the content generated and the content input that OpenAI open assigns all the right title and interest in um, yep. to you. And that means that you can use that content for any purpose, uh, including commercial purposes or sale or publication, um, you know, just as long as you comply with that, right? So right. It's, they're like very clear about that. They don't want to hinder people from being able to use it. And, uh, and I think they probably just don't want to like preempt every area of technology either by like calling that all their own intellectual Correct. property. Yeah, exactly. And then there's also the one thing that I actually did when I was actually preparing for this interview that I found that was interesting was that uh, they don't use your inputs for training data. So I would assume. Okay. So, yeah. Tell that... me more about that. Cause I think a lot of people feel like, you know, I think the, I think a lot of the general public feels like, you know, there's a lot of the, what you hear is like, you can put this data into it and then it's going to, you know, it can take that and, and yeah. use it. I was talking to a CEO of a, a, a professional sports team actually about this. And it's like, no, that's not quite it. So yeah. Can you go a little deeper on that? Because I think that is a concern for a lot of, you know, senior leaders where their teams are, you know, using it without their knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, what they're saying is that, you know, the use of content to improve their services, they say explicitly in their policy, we do not use content that you provide um, uh, to or receive from our API to develop or improve our services. And, you know, I don't know if that means that they don't like, because my understanding, even, you know, whether it's with the GPT 3.5 API or the four or whatever is the newest version of what it is that they're putting out that like, if I wanted to draft patent applications with that, for instance, and was providing it with some level of input that the more and more that I use it with my account, it's going to give me better and more curated results. Uh, but I think what they're saying though, is that that's just based on your own personal habits. Um, mm -hmm. And, the adjustments that you're making over time, that's right. and not the actual content that you're putting in. So I think that that's, you know, that must be what, you know, or it has to be some flavor of that. Right. Uh, but, but it is a little bit unclear because, I mean, they're very clearly saying that they don't use it. So how is it that we're continuing to improve the results? Um, Every time, if right? If I tell, that. that's right. Yeah, but it's like, I guess what you're saying though is that it's you know, potentially what we're saying, and again, disclaimer we are not we are not employees of open ai nor have proprietary information into it um the that it, it that that single thread is learning potentially but not the like not feeding back what i call kind of like the hive mind necessarily of like you know this equals that now i i learned that th that i was incorrect about this stat or something yeah. and now everyone else benefits yeah. from my knowledge verse that thread that you created benefiting from that knowledge. Is that, is that a decent summary? Yeah, that's, that's what I think. I think, you, okay. I mean, that's my personal, yeah. what I've extrapolated from my own investigations. Uh, but I think that in general, that it's not something to be, I mean, I do the same thing, right? Like we both work with lots of startups and growing technology companies yep. and have these conversations regularly, whether it's on the investment side or, you know, as service providers or whatever it is. Um, and I think that it, the folks that are actively using this appropriately, you know, this is not something to be afraid of. It's a new tool and right. uh, it's about, you know, using it effectively, but it is the right question, making sure we're not making any proprietary missteps as, you know, and especially as someone that works in IP, I mean, it's definitely the right question, but they're being very explicit that, it's all yours. So yeah, I think that just the policy itself says that's that that's great. Um, it just maybe the fear is that if we're entering our inputs in right, and maybe I you know I work for some yeah. you know deep tech company, we're putting our inputs in, but then there's some other company over in you know Massachusetts or something like that, and they're doing something similar. They don't even know who we are, but they're putting inputs yeah. in, and they're benefiting from 
the content that we've input in there. Yeah. Right. And that's, and, so, and that's, and that's not ha right. Hypoth like from what they say, that's not happening. That's, right. That's what they say. That's yeah. not happening. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's important. Like, like for a lot of people, I think that that's, that's a um, important caveat, you know, to a lot of this. And if we can find it, we'll probably, maybe we'll try to share the link to Keegan just in the show notes on some of this stuff, just so people can go check it out for themselves. Yeah. I've got, um, yeah, I've got all of them compiled here. He's love it. All right. Well, there you go. All right. So we'll share some of this too. So you all can go talk through it. What do you feel? Okay. So that this is, I think a good, foundation and just so you know so keegan do you have an extra like 10 minutes can we go yeah um, over? i can go i can go over yeah mm -hmm. okay let, yeah let's plan on if, you, if you're good with it let's go you know let's go at least yeah because we still got some good stuff to talk about here uh, yeah exactly man i'm like <laughs> oh, shit like again like i'm sitting here i'm taking notes um so good all right so that's always a good it's always good when i'm taking notes so all right um let's talk about maybe ownership then of content slash plagiarism issues so what are maybe some of the issues that could arise around you know whether it's infringement or usage of content from ai and how they might be handled legally you know and again like we've talked a little bit about it but if you know there's a lot of people out there cranking blog posts and doing this different stuff and you're starting to see it's like well, hey like i'm that was maybe derived from my original work this is bullshit yeah. you know so so how, yeah, exactly. how is this being handled right now yeah so i mean there's a couple different like scenarios that I've come up with, at least that I think that of how you would handle, at least for copyright, um, how you how you'd handle some infringement issues, right? So possibility number one is when somebody copies an AI generated work, right? And what portion, if any, of the AI generated content can be copyrighted, right? Is right. one question. Same then, for art too, right? Like the art. Same right? thing. That, that, yeah. yeah. Same thing. And so, and actually, that that's kind of the second part of what I'm going to talk about is. Yeah. Uh, an example where things are kind of blended. Um, and then, you know, the other question is, you know, like what was copied, you know, a copyrightable portion or a portion outside of copyright right. protection, right? This will, this will probably play out like somewhat like this uh, telephone book case that was right. called Feist. And, okay. uh, and then there's this, uh, the script, the scripture case uh, that we, we've already kind of, uh, there's another scripture case that I was going to talk about actually earlier what we, we okay. glazed over but anyways a, a defendant copied um the contents of a phone book and uh no infringement there there was no infringement because what was copied was not copyrighted copyrightable material right in, exactly. in this case it's just factual information describing who had what phone number right right so then like another scenario though like possibility number two of something that could happen there's an AI generated work that uses copyrighted material as training data mm -hmm. and is the output a derivative work? Is that something that, you know, right. It, 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 you know, it depends what's going to happen here. Right. So, you know, what it's do you not think a about subtle... that? Like, is that, is that the case? Right. Cause that's, you know, again, you're seeing a lot of this, right. We're training it using our proprietary, whatever, right. um, you know, content that could, you know, pending. There's pending lawsuits on this one. So this okay. one, there's not like court guidance on yet. So it's not like a settled matter, but it's, it's likely going to be the same test for copyright infringement that's typically used. And, right. uh, you know, including like whether copying can be proven in this particular case and proven um, that copying took place might involve discovery of training data, as well as comparison of the output of the allegedly infringed work. Right? This gets into what we were just kind of talking about. Yeah before like who's inputting what and then is that being you know reused and in, in what manner is it reused um and you know an interesting question that will arise is where the model is produced by one party and the output by another party who will be liable for the infringement right so who's the person that's actually infringing is it the guy that created the ai model or is it the is it the person that created the output Right. Because those could be two totally mm. different people. Yeah. Because right? all the time there's all these new services like that pop up for using AI for uh, human resources applications, using AI for, um, uh, you know, cancer treatments, using, AI, you know, yeah. whatever that is. Right. It's usually some sort of SaaS company, that's per, you know, might even just be like chat GPT wrapper around something. Yeah. And exactly. then, and then uh, but with some specific industry application. So is it like chat GPT? The infringer or is it the yeah the, the uploader or the the trainer. Stuff? yeah exactly yeah 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 okay that's interesting man so yeah. none of that's none of that's settled yet it's clear some, yet 
there's like these things called fair use factors that can come into play there too. That's like the purpose and character of the use and the nature of the copyrighted work and uh, the uh, amount of uh, sustainability um, of of portion of the portion the mountain sustainability of a portion taken. Um, right. And so like. Uh, and then, like, and I think usually the biggest question is usually what is the effect upon of the whole the potential market um, that this has, you know, and like excluding others. And we want to continue to push innovation forward, not stifle it. Right. So right. Um, that's that's what gets hard. And yeah. yeah. What, what are the implications? What are the implications you think? And again, this is a little, I mean, we're still so early. I mean, God, yeah. I mean we're at like step zero. I, don't, I just think like that's what most people have got to realize. You know, it's like, you. I mean, think about what's happened in the last year. It's like even, you know, what what's happening now is like, you know, it's not the people I've been talking for AI forever, but I think this has kind of been the first application that people just go, oh, this is different. You know, this is different, different. And, and, and what do you feel like, you know, again, think about, you know, the, the the data that I see and the insights and the prog you know, prognostication, which is a very big word, um, that I see is a, you know a lot around these you know very you know kind of higher end you know we'll call them white collar jobs, you mm -hmm. know where where the creativity originality originality strategy is being developed by these types of people who are doing this type of work or have some expertise in all these things. <sighs> What, it, what are some of the impacts that you think that this is going to have, you know, around, you know, again, like we talked a little bit about plagiarism, but just like human creativity and originality. If we're all initiating, yeah. if we're all initiating a new project idea from a prompt, which I mean, I, I'm guilty, you know, and for a lot of this stuff, I'm like, I can either go search Google to get me started or I can go to, to chat GPT. One's going to take me two hours to find like an okay, you know, kind of ideas. One's going to take me 25 seconds and it's decent. I pick it. Yeah. So, yeah. so what do you think like some of the potential, you know, implications are around creativity and originality here? Yeah. So, I mean, these are great. These are, these are, you know, great questions and bring in kind of, you know, like some moral questions as well. And, you know, how we approach that, you know, socially in the future and like, how will this affect, you know, our political system and elections and the way that we consume media and, you know, all that stuff. Right. So, you know, yeah. basically you'll have, you'll have right wing, like, you'll have right wing AI or left wing AI. That's like, that's where yeah, you, exactly. get, <laughs> that's where you yeah. get, yeah, news, Newsmax AI or something. Where your favorite AI. uncle can use to generate his content <laughs> on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, how do we ensure, you know, ethical use of AI generated content, you know, especially like considering the potential for misinformation, manipulation, and then um, I actually have clients that work on things like this, like the amplification of biases um, in content yeah. generated by language models like chat GPT. Cause uh, you know, you're taking um, all this uh, training data and training data um, sometimes uh, for like underserved populations, yeah. uh, you know, it ends up where for better lack of a better way of describing this in this moment that you end up with a kind of a racist AI uh, sometimes or like a gender discriminant AI. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so there's, there's folks actively working on this um, to try to solve some of these problems. Cause if you end up having like a bunch of resumes, for instance, that uh, are, you know, you have a hundred different resumes yeah. and you're and you're looking for a very specific thing. Maybe you end up only looking at like white people's resumes, Caucasian resumes. And you keep training it that way too. Uh, you because know, you're, whether it's that's getting the most training data because it's, yeah. it's the biggest population point. Right. So, yeah. And then, and then you end up with the same thing with genders, right? Is if you have tons more, you know, uh, males applying for something, you're going to end up with more training data for that, and you end up kind of, uh, you know, selecting those things. So, you know, anyways, that's as an, yeah. that's a, kind of a total aside. But getting back to the, you know, how do we ensure ethical use of this stuff? Like misinformation takes on like two types of impacts, right? Like it can mislead through reasoning or through rhetoric, and then reasoning attempts you know, to like sway people to a point of view through factual assertions, right? Right. And um, like, as with any like reasoned argument, this can be dealt with by verifying the factual premises and kind of like anal analyzing like the reasoning of it. But then there's like uh, rhetoric also, 
which is like, this is like where misinformation can <laughs> really shine. And, uh, you know, this is like often like disguised as like a well-reasoned argument, rhetorical arguments appeal to biases, emotions, uh, preconceived notions to sway opinion. And they sometimes like masquerade like, uh, as like a, uh, as a, like a rational argument, like the way that they're approached and you can do this, you know, um, you know, AI probably eventually can be suited to like generate these sort of arguments and this sort of content where you'll be, oh, writing, yeah. you know, this sort of, you know, rhetorical content. But then, you know, the other question that you're, you know, really kind of getting at is like, what are the, with, those are some of like the moral issues, but then it's also entwined with like, all these people losing their, you know, jobs as a result of AI content. I mean, I remember even like five years ago in Boston, there was this big billboard over uh, the Mass Pike that was like, AI is taking your jobs. Are you ready? And I was just like, this is really like yeah. some really fear-based marketing tactics. But I was like, but the, it is true. Lots of folks are losing their jobs because of uh, automation um uh ai based or otherwise but uh you know this would will free workers uh to be able to go work on other things and uh just as like we see like malls in america kind of slowly have like went away there's less box store locations and this is all part of the internet right but there's a lot of other warehousing jobs and um uh, logistics jobs that have been created uh, out of that as well. So I think that right. it's more like a repositioning than it is like a, all these jobs just kind of go away. It there's always a, is. Yeah, there's a version of it. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, think about, like you said, all those mall jobs, but, you know, unemployment's at, you know, X, right? Like some of the lowest it's, you know, been historically. So these jobs, like you said, reposition. What I, my, my, my take on it, Keegan, is, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of technology has been created and, you know, I come to this like sales and marketing technology to actually free people to be more creative. Like this, this technology will, will do these things behind the scenes or, you know, allow you to not remember to have to, you know, to follow up with these people so you can do more personalization. What I see in our kind of sales and marketing world is that the, the issue has actually been, we've been, we've, we've actually been dumbing down the human role, the human element of it to say, yeah. just execute what the machine says. Just, yeah. just the machine says to do this. Here's our best practice template. And so if anybody, you know, as you're listening to this, if you have a job where you are executing a template and you're not adding your own ex, you know, creativity or anything to it, that's first to go. You know, if it's just executing a process and you're just hitting send all or doing something, you got to think about, are you building skill sets that are uniquely human? And that, that's what yeah. I think a lot for people is you got to think, am I building, you know, either expertise on how to, how to get these systems and like, you know, prompt engineer jobs paying, you know, six figures now, Yep. you know, mid to low, you know, mid, mid six figures. Um, yeah. the, there's just so much opportunity you said, but again, for everyone listening, think, um, am I doubling down on my EQ skills? Am I doubling down on my, um, you know, not just taking something and hitting paste with it, but instead, you know, like you said, like running it through a filter or something and then, you know, thinking through how to, you know, optimize that. So, yeah. And, and that's yeah. the key, right? Whether it's for the medical, you know, whether you're a physician or you're a lawyer or you work in manufacturing or you're an engineer, whatever it is, right. You're, it's just a, it's going to be a tool that if you, if used effectively will help you do your practice oh my as a lawyer, doctor so better. much more. Um, and it'll it hopefully increase efficiency um, and create more opportunity. So yeah. you know, that's, the, that, that's what we hope. We're just kind of in the early stage. And whenever there's something new, we, I think there's just this social pushback. Like, oh, you know, like obviously oh, what's gonna happen? machines are going to take over. And, you know, like I saw Terminator when I was a kid. Like that's what's going to happen. They were now. saying that back then, right? Skynet, yeah, exactly, was, exactly. Skynet was back then and they didn't even have this, you know. So I yeah. look again. So, you know, I think for a lot of folks listening, um, you know, I think we could keep going on and on about this stuff forever, man. Like I said, I've mm -hmm. been taking notes and like this has been helpful. The last question I have for you, Keegan, is around um, and we're kind of teasing toward this is, you know, AI is going to revolutionize, enhance, you know, various industries. Um, what are the big benefits? You know, if you're someone out there listening and I'm kind of, you know, I was kind of giving my thoughts on 
kind of getting to step two faster, you know, of like the thought creation. What do you see for anyone out there in, in, in again, specific industries, like some of the top benefits that it's going to bring to these fields? So like in, in, uh, in almost any field that requires writing, generative AI will likely be able to produce like first drafts that aren't like at least today even can like produce first drafts that aren't exactly perfect and because they don't cover like all the nuances and details of like yeah. a finished product i mean we've plugged in we've we've tried to use ai to generate patent applications that work and we actively work on trying to do that and we, <laughs> um, we're like i think that you know some some firms might be like worried about that like oh we're going to lose our jobs like we want to figure it out so that we can do things faster and more efficient and you know be able to we're still going to be using our mind to get the broadest sort of patent applications that we can get for someone. This is yep. just making it. We're like the days that I need to send hacking exactly. away at a computer, which is basically not really using my mind. I'm just like, you know, going through the motions of, you know, exactly writing about what's in the, the, the figures that I created. Right. And so like, you know, I think that anything that requires writing, it's going to be able to like kick out these first drafts and, uh, and a, a lot of time in writing tasks that's like devoted to putting all the materials together and in the right order. And then AI can potentially automate like a lot of that process for us. Right. Um, and then like a similar approach can be used to enhance fields like um, computer programming and graphic design, oh, yeah. um, like computer programming, like think of all the hours and hours of code and things like that. Like, right. Like this is for us, like crazy for being able to use that. And I think that, again, this is something where we need to go, okay, cool. Let's not get too fearful of the code's going to generate code. And then next thing you know, there's war machines that are, you know, shooting down our buildings because they want to take over and they don't want any more humans. Um, the, you know, let's use this to our advantage to help advance society and, uh, you know, create a better future for the folks that follow after us. And I think that I think that's where we'll end up. You know, it'll be slow yeah. down like a lot of things. I mean, um, but I always like to think of AI like, you know, it's like akin to the internet, right? In like like the '90s, like internet boom, uh, or the dot com boom, like it was it was like a massive change. And this is, I think, the next big massive change. It's here. It's going to be in everything. We file hundreds of patent applications in AI across several different industries every year, and each year we file more and more, right? So yeah. we get more, and and people get more and more specific with the sort of industry applications that they have for them. So the, the, I, I don't, I, and I, like you said, this is the early days. We're just at the beginning. There's a lot of exciting things to come and there's a lot of questions yet unanswered too. I agree. Yeah. And again, I think hopefully for people listening, um, you know, maybe you're a little less afraid, which I think is hopefully a, a good thing, but also I think more educated on, um, you know, just starting what I said, what I say to a lot of you know, senior leaders, especially you know, people that have 15, 20, 30 years of experience and, um, you know, the skills that made that got you to where you are are, are, are going to be the same, but you're going to have to adapt to maybe a different way you think about processing information to think about how to leverage your point AI to get to step three, or there will be people that figure that out and can get 80% as good, you know, faster. So for anyone listening, you know, hopefully there's been some really good food for thought here on what like, where we're at today what's possible don't be scared embrace it continue to learn and grow and and i love this man this is a great conversation keegan really appreciate you joining me man yeah uh thanks for having me on i appreciate it it was uh um and i'm sorry i had to cancel our first scheduled time. no don't no yeah, don't, thanks don't, for being don't. flexible uh, <laughs> always man. i've had personal life disasters but uh yeah it was great to talk with you today and uh um if anyone has any questions uh, about this stuff, where can they find you? Yeah, questions man. about these things or interested in intellectual property protection for their for their own projects um, or their tech company looking for any help, um, they can they can find us at uh, CaldwellLaw.com, right. and uh, they can also uh, you know they can find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, pretty easy, just type in Keegan Caldwell into LinkedIn. We'll link to it for everyone. There's only yeah, one we'll... of me, luckily, so that's that's pretty easy, and. Uh, um, yeah, we'll provide some links as well. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. We'll put that in there for it, man. So, all right, everyone, thank you again. Uh, really appreciate you joining us and we'll see you next week.